are Myth Vision. The 12 tribes of Myth Vision are here with Professor Andrew Tobolowski. Did I pronounce it properly? Yeah, Tobolowski. Tobolowski. I, I didn't ask you before we hit record, like, how do I properly pronounce your name? Welcome to Myth Vision. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. I truly appreciate you giving me your time. I hope that uh, we can dig through some of this material, giving people some satisfaction um, in their understanding of what's going on with the tribes of Israel, the list of the tribes, and maybe as time goes by throughout history, how the reception of becoming Israel is incorporated, like like late Second Temple Judaism, um, we may not have time, and maybe we can preserve this kind of conversation on getting into the medieval ages and, of course, uh, future, where we talk about Native Americans or getting into like how the Mormons are saying, hey, by the way, did you know? <laughs> um, those are fun topics, but I, I figure we'd go more on the historical route in the past, sure. biblically speaking, and then in the future we can do more. I want to give a plug. Got to give a plug. I'm really enjoying this book. That's telling you I haven't completed it, uh, <laughs> which is also why I want to continue because there's too much going on in this book. The Myth of the 12, 12 Tribes of Israel. I know it's a little pricey here, but you don't make the prices. So if anybody really wants to blame somebody, blame publishers for uh, the academic presses, if you will, for their cost. But I can't recommend this book enough. I'm an, a fan of this kind of topic and diving into what's going on in the Bible. Tell us a brief description of your book because we're really going to be diving into it. Um, what's this book all about? Sure. Yeah. So uh, a lot of my work has dealt with the biblical tradition of the 12 tribes of Israel, which is essentially how the Bible defines Israel, uh, at least the Hebrew Bible from beginning to end. Uh, I got interested in how many other people around the world identify as Israel over the last really 2,500, 3,000 years, uh, generally speaking, through the same tradition. So it's a book about how people from biblical times to the present have used this tradition to describe themselves as Israel, to come up with Israelite histories, and just all the things that that um, this really interesting, complex genealogical tradition can do. Now, this is from a synagogue. What, what um, period is this uh, image from a synagogue? It's the early first millennium. Uh, CE. I don't remember exactly which one it came from. Uh, this is the first time I've worked with a publisher that has a marketing department. So it was it was their idea and I, I went with it. That's how I made my thumbnail. I took this image and just made the thumbnail out of it. Get you a copy. So uh, so uh, Dr. Tobolowski, Tobolowski is like, you know what, I'm going to come back on this channel because they're actually trying to, you know, learn about what my work is, is about. And Myth Vision is all about that. My fans are legit. You did a couple different interviews, or need I say one interview, but the other one is based purely on your work, which is what happened to the 10 lost tribes of Israel on religion for breakfast. My buddy, Dr. Andrew Henry, go check out that show when you're done because it's very well edited, um, briefly just getting you through what's going on here. And that is based on your work. But also my buddy, Brother Garfield podcast on Scholars 20 for 20. And you were, I think, the 20th, the last of the that's, last. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, the last shall be first, right? Uh, anywho, <laughs> I hope you go check out that interview after you uh, have watched this one and then also get you some salvation by joining Myth Vision's uh, Patreon or just join the tribes of Myth Vision. I put that down there in the little banner beneath. All right, we're done plugging. I, I want to get into some content. <laughs> so, the 12 tribes of Israel have always been uh, the case, right? Historically, I'm being sarcastic, there's always been 12 tribes, right? What's right. the problem with this? What's what's the issue? Yeah. There, there's all kinds of problems. So it's um, the, the Hebrew Bible actually has roughly 14 different tribes that it lists at one time or another as part of the 12 tribes of Israel, which includes uh, Levi and Joseph or Ephraim and Manasseh, or often depicted as Joseph's. Uh, two sons. The earliest lists don't always have 12 tribes. Um, the uh, lists and orders of the tribes change a lot. And uh, according to, you know, the, one of the, the big things that's happened is that the, the history that the Bible tells uh, is very long in comparison to the actual history of ancient Israel, as we now think of it. So, you know, you got different 
orientations to did the exodus happen that kind of thing mm -hmm. but really your history of israel starts i don't know sometime in the 10th century bc and even in the hebrew bible already by the 8th century bc most of the tribes are not around anymore so a lot of this history and a lot of this composition came after the heyday of however many tribes there were uh, and it's looking backwards on the sort of golden age and that's that's really where i got started because it, it's not that different from what other people after israel are doing they're also looking backwards to this period and, and attaching themselves to it through this tradition that was what really blew my mind so i hope people like what you just said was a missile i think that uh once it enters and it, it it'll explode um in your book, you point out how Judah, I'm cutting to the chase, giving you a tease as we'll spell this out. Judah inserts themselves into the 12 tribe motif, making them like the special son, actually. So, I mean, who wouldn't want to be the special son, especially if you're priests are the ones compiling and redacting or right. putting this together. So Judah is probably, and I want your thoughts on this historically speaking, and then biblically, maybe you can paint two pictures here. Yep. Uh, Judah was never probably really in that kind of relationship with Israel. From what I understand historically, and even hints in the Bible is they were right. always at war with each, with each other. So were they really Israel ever to begin with? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a lot of scholars now who think that the answer might be no. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's the majority scholarly opinion yet, but there's a lot of uh, well-regarded scholars who have this view. And when you think about what evidence we have, it, it becomes clear that it's not that unlikely a prospect. Because again, you know, the actual history of ancient Israel, even in the Hebrew Bible, it tells us that after the reigns of David and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split into two parts, Israel and Judah. And those two kingdoms didn't get along, like you just said. Uh, then Israel was conquered in 722, and Judah continued until 586. So they have different histories. They have different political situations. Um, so if they were, if Israel was ever one people, even according to the Hebrew Bible's vision of this history, that period didn't last very long compared to the period in which they were separated, in which they had different, they were conquered at different times, they had different exiles, they had different returns. But when you start to look at it, there really isn't a lot of evidence from early traditions that Judah was part of Israel at that time. So Judges 5 is probably the oldest tribal list there is. It doesn't include the tribes that are most often associated with Judah. It doesn't have Judah itself. It doesn't have Levi. It doesn't have Simeon. Uh, I've written other articles on this topic where if you look at the book of Judges, which is about the period right before the, the kingdoms, most of the tribe, most of the judges that are from Israel, it gives them a name uh, of a tribe. So, you know, we know that Samson is a Danite. We know that Gilead, uh, Gideon is a Manassite and so on and so forth. The Judahite judges tend not to be named according to their tribe. There's Ibsan, the Bethlehemite. There's uh, Othniel, the son of Caleb. So there's a lot of different evidence in, in different parts of the Bible that suggests that however Judahites were identifying themselves before the period when we get a lot of biblical texts written, it's probably different from how the Israelites were. And if you just do a straightforward reading of the evidence, you look at something like Judges 5, which doesn't have these tribes. And then you look at the heyday of when everybody agrees the most 12 tribe lists were written. Um, it's much later on. It just looks like the Judites expanded whatever this original Israelite tradition was so that it included them, the tribe of Judah, the tribes of Simeon and Levi. Uh, and it becomes this vision of all Israel that may not have actually existed. Oh, um, so... I got to take one thing at a time because there's so much that comes at me in this book that I've read so far. Uh, when do you, when do scholars date the list of 12 tribes? Um, there's even a reference somewhere where some of the 10 lost tribes was like once, right. I think, uh, throughout right. the Hebrew Bible, like one mention of this. But the, the 12 tribes, when do these lists appear in history that scholars think? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are actually um, roughly 26 lists of the tribes. And a lot of my work has really been about just how many there are, because people don't really talk about that. They talk about the tradition. They don't talk about it really. Um, we don't know when they were all written. So scholars will differ, differ on this. But we all agree that the vast majority of them were written between the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, which is to say they're, you know, in, there's 15, I think, lists in the, the Pentateuch. Um, almost all of them by the... Pentateuchal author, we call the priestly author, who everybody thinks is an exilic or post-exilic author. There's six of them in uh, 
the books of Chronicles, which everybody thinks is a, a Persian period or later book, which is to say that it was after the Judites were exiled and came back when the Persians conquered the Babylonians. It's already getting to 2021 of the 26 lists that we have that we know were written, not just after Israel was conquered by Assyria, but after Judah was conquered by Babylon. So again, just a really straightforward reading of the evidence suggests that at the very least, this is when Judites got really interested in the 12 tribes of Israel. And then when you start adding to that by saying, can we really prove that this tradition goes back much earlier? It's hard to do. You know, there are some people who say this list is early so that, you know, Genesis 49, 49 is a normal 12 tribe list. Many people think it's pretty early. So somebody might point to that. I think it's probably built from parts a little bit later on and some of the parts early. But an example of how the, the Bible actually deals with these tribal traditions is what you mentioned, the lost tribes. So the 10 lost tribes of Israel are a very famous uh, mythological idea that they've been, uh, there's a million stories about them in a million places. But the odd thing about it is the number 10 doesn't come from the biblical account of the conquest and loss of the tribes of Israel. It comes from one text, like you say, 1 Kings 11, 12, which describes the division of David and Solomon's kingdom into two. And it says that the Israelites had 10 tribes and the Judites either got one or two of this 12. Doesn't name the tribes of Israel. Uh, and I think it's more complicated than a lot of people think. But either way, when we get to this 2 Kings 17 text that describes this conquest, uh, it doesn't say that 10 tribes were lost there. It just says that all Israel besides Judah was. Uh, hmm. So this, this is a story that's taken on the life of its own the same way that the 12 tribes tradition has. So is it fair, just to be simple, it's fair to, to say there are there's not a unified story about this tribes and lost tribes and stuff. So if people are painting a narrative in their head that like, well, there is literally 10 lost tribes. That's only one like right. passage. There are variations of this myth that are all over the place. So the Bible is not telling you one narrative. That's right. And there's two different texts. I mean, it's the, the text that happens 200 years earlier before the, the tribes would have been lost. It says there were 10 tribes of Israel and two tribes in Judah. It's never, no other um, text tells us how many tribes lived in Israel. So the text, 2 Kings 17, that tells us that all of the tribes that lived in Israel as opposed to Judah were lost into Assyrian exile, which, first of all, that isn't true, which we can talk right. about as well. Um, <laughs> this but, gets into the Samaritan issue, too. That's right. Yeah. But that text doesn't say 10. No other text says 10. It doesn't say, it doesn't name them. It doesn't say which tribes went where. It just says they went into, into Assyrian exile. And so then there's a huge body of traditions, early Jewish traditions, some early Christian traditions that eventually expand really across the entire world about where some of these tribes went and who they might be. Um, but the Bible is very unspe unspecific about who was lost and how many and so on. In the introduction of your book, I think you take the idea of a more um, earlier meaning, or sorry, not earlier, later, like in the Persian period, maybe, and I wanted to ask your thoughts on this because you say Persian comfortably, like I'm cool with the Persian era being when this stuff is actually being written, compiled, yeah. the priest and whatnot. Um, and that's fair to say. I mean, Persia literally sets them back up. I mean, they're they're, they're on the up, not on the down, um, which makes a lot of sense. But is it possible that you see it in the early Greek era? Is Because I see a lot of these numbers. And you talk about the list, which I wanted to ask you about Jacob. You mentioned how Isaac births or has, <laughs> the Bible does seem to indicate it, like almost like man births the, the children. But yeah. um, Isaac has two children, Esau and Jacob. And right. these are two nations. And then there's 12 sons of Jacob and they're right. not nations. They're, they're yeah. like, so what's going on in the myth of this genealogy yeah. and how does this play out? Does this have any connections yeah. to Greece? You think? I think, I think it probably does. So this is um, the technical part of the book. And I really wanted to try to write this book for anyone who was interested and not as much for scholars, although I think there are some dense parts. Uh, but the technical part of the book is about a kind of genealogy that's called a segmented genealogy. So we have linear genealogies, which are just father to son or mother to daughter. So-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. People who have read the Bible, they know this kind of genealogy. Um, the segmented genealogy is more like a, a textual family tree. And you can think of the 12 tribes of Israel as one of these, because it's Jacob and, you know, his the four women he had children with, and then it's all 12 of them, and it follows their descendants, and so on and so forth. But the thing about segmented genealogies is that they're, they don't, they're subject to interpretation in the way that linear genealogies aren't. 
where there's 12 different groups in the 12 tribes genealogy, you don't have to imagine them as all part of the, the same thing. And that's the point I was making with the, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of it all, where it's like, how is it the case that we have in Genesis? Abraham has a bunch of children that are all supposed to be separate nations. Isaac has two children. They're supposed to be separate nations. Jacob has 12 children. They're all supposed to be the same nation. Just to point out that the decision to treat these separate entities as part of the same entity is a, is a sort of narrative and interpretive choice. And then you think about the reality of this historical period when actually the people of Israel, if the Judites, even if the Judites identified as Israelites, are still split between two different kingdoms. So already this segmented genealogy is providing a kind of bridge between two different places. It's a good form to say people who live in different places are really one people because it's already broken up into parts. And then it is very easy to say, and then some of those parts went to Asia because they were conquered by the Assyrians, deeper into Asia because they were conquered by the Assyrians. Some of these parts went to America and they became the Native Americans. You know, some of these traditions and myths that we have out there all build upon what is already the central feature of this tradition, that it breaks Israel into parts. It's okay with Israel being in different parts. And when you look at other levels of this segmented genealogy, Abraham, Isaac, and so on and so forth, you can see that that's not this inevitable thing that happens. You can think of parts as being separate from each other just as easily as being part of the same thing. And that's a clever way to insert yourself if you're inventing a, a mythological origin narrative where you are always or always have been a part right. of this kingdom called Israel, just a different part of the same sons <laughs> of Jacob. And therefore, you can insert yourself in the narrative. Um, so and just uh, you mentioned yeah. the Greek thing. And this is some this sort of my first book is about uh, it's called The Sons of Heracles. Sons of Jacob, but it was um, Sons of Jacob, Sons of Heracles, but it was uh, it's a dissertation book, so it's like not as professional. Um, it's not written for as wide an audience as this one is. But yeah, the the fact of the matter is, we don't have these segmented genealogies in Mesopotamia. We don't have them in Egypt. We have them mainly in ancient Greece, and what they do there is precisely what you're describing. So people talk about Panhellenism, the idea that all Greeks are they share an identity. They're all part of this Panhellenic framework. It's built genealogically. Just like there's somebody named Jacob and he has 12 sons, there's somebody named Helen and he has a bunch of children as well. And his children are Ion and Doros and Iolos and those correspond to the Ionians and the Dorians and the Iolians in the same way that Reuben, Judah, Simeon are the Reubenites, Judahites, uh, Simeonites. But we know that Panhellenism appeared for the first time in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE and that in Homer's time, for example, there's no... Panhellenic Greece. So we can see this genealogy being used to expand and include groups that it didn't originally include to create Panhellenism. And I, I think it's reasonable to say that you know, it's like it's possible at least that something like that happened in Israel as well, where the genealogy was expanded to combine Judah and Israel in the same way and create what we might call a Pan-Israelitism. And I do think that that would point to a kind of Hellenistic influence whether you need to be talking about the Hellenistic period, which is after right. you know, the great conquerors, the Persians and the three thirties to do that, or whether you can say, you know what, there are, there are Greeks all over the Mediterranean. You know, we know the the alphabet made it from Phoenicia to Greece in the eighth century BC. We don't, um, you know, things came back as well. We don't need to be, they don't need to be under Greek rule to be influenced by Greece. But on the other hand, who knows? You know, I think it's a reasonable. There's a lot of people who think this is Hellenistic stuff instead. I was going to say you could see how this gives a bone to minimalist, but uh, right. you know, it's like, hey, you can have it. But um, it could be the case that it's minimalism in this respect, and then maybe just earlier traditions, you know, that are being kind of compiled into their own formation of stuff. Um, something to mention about the Greeks is, uh, as I was studying, the Athenians seem to be what's the term? I guess. Is it fair to say xenophobic? I don't know, but it's like they had an extremely exclusive tribalistic view that they were somehow yeah. superior. That right. sounds like Judah in respect to the rest of the tribes. And so right. while the Athenians saw themselves as part of the greater Greece, at least later, as you're talking about pan-Hellenistic period, they still saw an exclusivity. It, like we're really special though. Like right. we descend from the gods in a unique way and they had kind of their own mythology there. Um, that overlap with Judah, look at Genesis 49, they get special treatment. And so you'd imagine priest in Judah writing this stuff going, right. it's us, you know, it's us, baby. Yeah. Did you want to comment yeah. on that? 
when you look at a, as you look at segmented genealogies, the way I've come to think of them is that they are um, tables of contents. And the way that stories that incorporate them work is they highlight some of that table of contents as being more important than others. But the, the table is just a table, it's just 12 tribes. And the simple fact that you can tell a new story that explains why Simeon is better than Judah or Judah better than Simeon is why there's this 3,000 year history of telling tribal stories. But yeah, it's a lot like what happens in Athens. So the Athenians actually had a problem because initially their, their myth was that they were autochthonous. They were born out of the ground of Athens. And it turns out if that is your tradition, you can't participate in this sort of genealogical back and forth because you're not related to anybody. So it seems like in the sixth century BC, they start uh, describing themselves as Ionians. The Ionians at that point lived on the west coast of Asia Minor. So they were sort of the only Ionians on this side of the Aegean. And um, they, so that they claim descent from Ion, who was a descendant of Helen, and that's how they inscribed themselves in the genealogy. And then you get to something like Euripides' play Ion, where Ion normally has had a human father. But this play is about how actually Ion's father is secretly Apollo. That's the kind of thing you see people doing with genealogies, where they're always trying to modify it and introduce new details to elevate themselves in comparison to other people. And it's a great system for comparing and contrasting. And that's what you get in a lot of the chapters in, in my book as well, where you just see people telling the same story, but explaining why among the tribes of Israel, whoever they are, whether they're the, the Beta Israel, the Samaritans, the Mormons, whoever, this is why they're the the real Israel in comparison to other Israels or the most favored part of Israel or whatever. And I think that that does go back to the Bible. I think it's already happening in the Hebrew Bible. I want to ask you two things here. I hope you can remember these. Is the names of God in, in particular about the tribes, is there any significance with God's name being relevant to particular tribes and then different tribes use the different name of God, of course, mm -hmm. but really these far enough back would have been different deities um there's that idea does that play anything into the tribes and then the second thing just so i don't forget is the the tribal genealogical method that they're using in greece to try and pan hellenistic is always going back to a god seems right. to have birthed them or a demigod in some sense is what yeah. so do you think there was temptation from the Hebrews or to, from those who claim to be Israel to have their descendancy from a deity or saying Abraham was really not just mortal? There's like, I, I don't know. Is there any evidence of that? Yeah. So uh, I don't know that there is much significance to the names of God in terms of the tribal names in the Hebrew Bible. I, I think, I guess that you could, if you really wanted to think of some of the later sources as Judite, look to see whether they use specifically different names than, than Israelites do. Um, what we know from basically one of the, one of the ways that we look into this is people's names, because a lot of names have what's called a theophoric element, which is to say it has a name of God in it. So like um, Jeremiah, the Yah at the end is for Yahweh or Joseph, the Yo at the beginning is for Yahweh. So in both Israel and Judah, there's lots of Yahweh names. In Israel, there's also, it seems like, more names that are that have other gods than there are in Judah. So it seems like Judah is more devoted to specifically Yahweh than Israel is. It's the most popular god name in both places, but there's more diversity in Israel. So that is interesting. And then, you know, I think you do get cold centralization later on in Judah that impacts the Hebrew Bible. Um, the other thing is, when you're talking about tribal genealogical traditions and their relation to religious systems, you know, you just have polytheism in, in ancient Greece, which, you know, there may have been more polytheistic stuff um, early on in Israel and Judah than there is later on. I think most people would agree that the religion becomes more monotheistic over time. Right. But there are no stories of humans being the children of God in the Hebrew Bible, there is a one about the, them being the children of angels in Genesis. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any Near Eastern stories about demigods, but demigods just play, and I think it probably the reverse of what you might expect, which is that demigods play an important role in a lot of Greek traditions. A lot of the Trojan War heroes are demigods, which is to say one of their parents is a god. And people really actually want to be descended from the heroes 
and not the gods so much. In the Euripides example that I pointed out, obviously that's they wanted to be descended from Apollo. But what do you think uh, about the idea that Genesis six with the sons of God might be early Hellenistic or mm -hmm. even Persian with the influence of Panhellenism and whatnot? Is that this is kind of a demythologizing not only with Mesopotamia and Egypt utilized yeah. in Genesis, but also the Greek heroes, and that they're kind of stabbing at them in a competitive model. Right. I mean, it, it could well be. I think um, Genesis 1 through 10 is notably different from the rest of Genesis. It's about, you know, floods and creations and things like that. Genesis 11 starts with Abraham and you get a kind of normal story about a family. They experience the miracles, but it's just people. Everyone thinks Genesis 1 through 10 is, is a different kind of thing. I've never had a good idea about when it comes from. You know, nothing has ever occurred <laughs> to me about, you know, because there's no like... It's, it has some relationship to Babylonian flood myths, but not a whole lot of evidence about where the story of Noah comes from. Uh, <clears throat> it's really interesting to me that Genesis starts where it does, because there aren't a whole lot of ancient histories, period. Mostly ancient people didn't write history in the way that we, we think they did. So it would have made sense to just start with Israel and not the creation of the world. Um, but that in and of itself doesn't suggest to me anything useful. And I don't yeah. have any insights on that one. I just wanted to throw it out there just to like say, I've heard, um, I don't know if you've heard of Russell Gamirkin. He, yeah, sure. he gets like an honorary approach from um, the, uh, what's the particular school of thought? Yeah, Russell's a big, big guy into the, the Hellenistic origins in the Bible. Right, right. And, you know, I'm a very cautious whatever approach we take, but it's just something to, think about uh, along the way. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, let me pull up my notes here because there's, there's something that you say. Okay. It appears that Judah inserted themselves into the tribal list of Israel. And I'm going to get to the super chats here in a bit. I just want to get through the beef here. So, so the super chats are for people who want to join the 12 tribes of myth vision here. Um, what it is, is they're just financially helping us out, keeping the lights on, but they can ask you questions if you don't mind along the way. And we can just, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the questions I typed was, it appears that Judah inserted themselves into the tribal list of Israel. Your book discusses becoming Israel, and it appears right. Judah became part of this narrative. Does this role of becoming Israel go beyond the genealogical right. model? Meaning, right. when did people who are not part of the tribes of Israel start becoming part of Israel with no genealogical ties to start mm -hmm. with? That's a great point. Uh, sorry, that's a great question. So um, one of the things that I, that I always try to make clear when I talk about this book is that when I say the myth of the 12 tribes of Israel, I'm not using myth to mean fake story. It's not really an expose. Uh, I do happen to think that there probably wasn't a particularly early 12 tribe tradition, but <clears throat> I'm using myth to mean this is a story that took on a life of its own. Right. And, that's how I understood it too, as someone yeah, who's titled great. Myth's that's, Vision, you know? Yeah, so there you go. Um, <laughs> but, but this is the thing about it, because even in ancient Israel, because of the division of the kingdoms, because of all the different things that happened to the two kingdoms, uh, there's no very good reason for Judah to go on identifying itself as Israel when it's its own country, kingdom, for such a long period, when it's independent, when they haven't been uh, together for such a long time and the way the scholars now think about ethnicity itself has changed a lot and not all biblical scholars have responded to that so now we think of ethnicity as fluid in a way that we didn't before so that people you know not really consciously but they do sort of pick and choose who they think they are so it would have been possible and here's the example i, I always use i talk about the american revolution i say if after the american revolution the americans went on thinking of themselves as british we can understand why they would do that because a lot of the same things are true between America and Britain as were true between Judah and Israel, similar identical language, similar language, uh, similar religious traditions, family ties, customs, and so on and so forth. But because they didn't, we can see that somebody who creates a new country can change their identity as well. So my point is whether or not the Judaites are biologically descended from Israelites, whether or not they already thought, always thought of themselves as Israelites. And I have my own opinions on the subject that we've discussed, but whether or not they are still describing themselves as Israel in a way that is Judaite, in a way that works for them, in a way that makes sense in the time period that they're in, 
And that makes them not terribly different from anybody else who, who does it later on. Um, so we can talk about whether or not they really have this biological genetic connection to the early Israelites. I think it's a tough question to answer. But when you're talking about the inheritance of traditions, the Judahites did what they wanted to do with that. Mm -hmm. They constructed a vision of Israel that was theirs, which is what I call becoming Israel. And so did all of these other people later on. So I was really trying to tell the story of people who have taken the story and made it their own from the beginning without worrying too much about who is or isn't really Israel. I think there are, I mean, I think the Samaritans really are descended from the early Israelites, but That's... I still think the Samaritan vision of Israel is Samaritan and it came from a certain time period. And that, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. There's a lot there. Really good stuff you're mentioning. Um, so technically the story of the Bible, if we were to try, there's a bunch of bumps, but let's try to pave over some of these bumps. Mm -hmm. Ultimately is the story of Israel in Judah being the center of that like story. So like right. Jerusalem is the holy place. Technically, right. I know there's little hints, the Samaritan, you know, Gerizim, right? Like there's hints in the Bible itself. That's Even right. the one that we have today that would have been authored mainly by the Southern tribes, there's some stuff left in there that gives us an idea of fossil, some other tradition. But ultimately, it's the Judah's vision of Israel. And um, the, the question I have in that idea is that if they can attach themselves to the narrative and create their own narrative, that's why I was asking, can people join or when did people join who weren't genealogically tied? Right. Um, when did that kind of um, fluid boundary that yeah. used to be seemingly genealogical, and even then, I'm not sure if it ever really was. I've heard Christine Hayes give lectures on this. I've heard others who give lectures about this and saying right out the gate in the Genesis account with Abraham, it sounds like his descendants, right, would be like, here's the promises to his descendants. But right out the gate, people who aren't his descendants are like latching on to this thing and yeah, they're getting yeah. – attached to it. So when do you think non-Israelites, if I could put that term, that includes yeah. Judahites and any other ites that might fit into the narrative, right. when can they latch themselves into Israel and be considered Israel? Yeah. So if we're we're not counting the Judahites as not Israelites, which we, we might, I think basically the Bible, its traditions, doesn't leave the region of Israel until Christianity starts to spread around the world. There is a Jewish diaspora as well, so I don't want to discount that. Um, but it's basically the Christian evangelical uh, work that spreads the traditions of the Bible around the world. And I think once people start identifying according to the faith tradition, that is the Hebrew Bible, that's when they can start identifying according to the identity traditions that you have in the Hebrew Bible. And I think it happens pretty fast that, uh, you know, there's, there's conversation in, in the early church that, you know, people who have converted to Christianity, even if they are not from Israel, they're not descended from these people, might think of themselves as part of the tribes of Israel. Um, and it just picks up as time goes on. So, you know, um, in the in the medieval period, there starts to be a lot of interest in the, the prophecies that suggest that the 12 tribes of Israel will be restored at the end of days and bring about the end of the world. A lot of Christians start wanting to be members of the tribes of Israel. There's still a lot of tension and kind of an anti-Semitic tension where the lost tribes of Israel are often viewed as this great enemy as well. So it's mm -hmm. very confused. On the one hand, we want to be Israel. On the other hand, we're afraid of Israel. Uh, so you see when the Crusades are happening, um, they start in Western Europe hearing about the Mongols who are invading uh, the Arab regions first before they'll eventually invade Europe. And at first... Um, I think God's probably the lost tribes of Israel coming back. And that tradition sort of changes as time goes on. Um, these identifications happen on the basis of uh, hope for the end of the world, uh, fear of the end of the world. They happen on the basis of, you know, this is just a tradition that's very important to us and we want to be part of it. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it just happens unconsciously. People really genuinely believe that they must be descended from the tribes of Israel, even if there's there's no real proof there. Okay, a couple more questions. I'll take mm -hmm. some super chats, and then if ideas come, I know there will be. Um, you mentioned all Israel. This is a interesting phrase that me being an ex-evangelical Christian who, like, 
loved reading the Bible and reading the New Testament, Paul says in Romans 11, That's right. when the yeah. fullness of the nations, fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all Israel will be saved. What does it mean, all Israel? And I know you're not a Pauline scholar, but right. like we, we sometimes have to look and see what other contexts say about this term for all Israel. Because if we imagine it back in the Hebrew Bible, we might imagine northern and southern kingdom. And what does all Israel mean? Do we right. do we imagine that's what's going on in the New Testament? What do you think? So in the in the Hebrew Bible, all Israel is Israel and Judah. And that's part of why you don't see that phrase, I think, in too many early traditions. But yeah, I think that in, in the early church, it started meaning people who had become part of the nation of Israel purely by faith, by converting into to Christianity, whatever their background was. And I think um, there are the people who embrace the lost tribes of Israel tradition. When they say all Israel, that that's what they mean. Um, that you know the the Mormons or the the Beta Israel or whoever are part of all Israel now. So as I say, there's this twelve tribe framework. Um, it makes it very easy to latch onto because it is very easy to say, oh, this part of the tribe of Dan went to North Africa and became. <laughs> the beta israel and that's why the beta israel are different from other israelites but also they're part of all israel and so on and so forth that pattern is repeated in, in pretty much every story i talk about in my book um the in revelation you know you got uh, a discussion of how some from all, all of the tribes of israel are going to be saved I, I have to think that there's something in there that's a little bit beyond biological descent from the original israelites and it isn't the list a little different too there in uh, Revelation 14 and 7? I think it's seven chapter 7 and chapter 14 where the list is a bit different than yeah, the list we see. I think there's some complications. I, I you know, I steer clear of the New, the New Testament in a lot of my work because I uh, happen to know lots of great Christianity scholars and uh, I'm afraid of what they might think. I think they're, you know, they know their stuff. You had Robin Walsh on your uh, right. podcast recently. We actually got our PhDs together. Wow. Uh, once upon a time. And, you know, I know a lot of great Paul scholars, so uh, I leave it up to them. But I'm I curious. I mean, this opens up a can, you know, of worms, but I'm curious to know why the academics, for the most part, other than I think Jason Staples, he's the mm -hmm. only gentleman who thinks that Paul, when he quotes something from Hosea 8 8, where it talks about, uh, you will no longer be my people. And then yeah. he's using it for his Gentile audience, his, his people um, in Romans nine through 11. I'm curious why academics don't uh, run to that kind of position overall. Typically they think he's using the scriptures to his own needs. And right. I think rabbis did this a lot where they kind of apply it as I pointed out in this book, which you haven't read it yet, but I, that's why I brought it up to the table. Yeah. It's like, Rabbis were using the scriptures and they were saying, you know, this non-Israelite who comes in, it does say Abraham would be the father of many goyim. Right. And what are the goy? Well, they're people who aren't Israel, yeah. according to the definition. So that's how it's understood by the, the Jews. And I was curious to know if you thought that there was something going on there, because in one passage in Acts, I know you're not a New Testament person. I yeah. just wanted to bring up is it's actually referencing in Acts chapter one, verse six. This is when the whole Holy Spirit comes down. They're speaking in tongues. Jesus yeah, is yeah. supposed to ascend all of that. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The question I have for you is Judah is the focus of the biblical narrative. Ultimately, I'm not saying right. others aren't mentioned, but they're the focus. Is it fair to say Judah is the kingdom of Israel? By the first century? I think a consciousness of the distinction between Israel and Judah is lost by that period. Uh, I think that you also see it in a lot of prophetic books that are from so the early prophets seem to think of, like Isaiah, uh, seem to have more of an idea of the distinction between Israel and Judah than you see by the time you get to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and people like that. They, when they say Israel, mean Judah. And sometimes Judah and Israel, but definitely Judah. So I think that they are, and again, Paul, specifically in the New Testament and Acts, are, are not things that I'm an expert on. I know. But I, I, I you know, I'm having fun with you because right. I want to have more episodes, and I know you got a yeah. one year old now. Um, yeah. But there's that passage in Acts 13 where Paul stands up in the synagogue, and I don't know if this is what Paul really did, but let's just give Acts the benefit of the doubt. He stands up and motions with his hand and says, Men of Israel and yeah. you God fears. Listen, 
well, he's talking to Jews in a synagogue. So he's talking to people of Israel. I suspect Jews would be synonymous with Israel. And if that is the case, when we get to Romans 9 through 11, and he's like, I wish I was cut off because the Jews aren't accepting his message. He wished they would, but they won't. Yeah. He's incorporating Gentiles. All Israel, after the multitude of Gentiles, or the when the when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all Israel, is this the Jews or Judah? Yeah. Well, Question. I, my sense of things is that in the first century CE, it, uh, it switched. And I, I'll tell you about something that happens in, in the fourth chapter of my book in, for the Mormons, which is that the Book of Mormon suggests that Mormons are supposed to evangelize to the lost, to the Native Americans. Because the Book of Mormon is a story about how um, <clears throat> people out of the tribe of Manasseh came to America and eventually became some or all of the Native American tribes. But Mormons didn't have a whole lot of luck uh, proselytizing to Native Americans, and they did have a lot of luck proselytizing to the British and to Scandinavians in this early period. And so all of a sudden you start to see, and I don't want to imply that it's, you know, just um, for an advantage, but you suddenly <laughs> start to see the idea that Israel actually might be everywhere. You know, we don't have to worry about the, they might be everywhere. My sense is the same essential thing happens in the first century CE, where initially the idea is that, you know, we're Jews, we're Israelites, we're Judites, it's all the same. Whatever, but as soon as Christianity starts catching on in other places, the definition of Israel expands. So it's like, well, it's believers. It's not just biological descendants. I So I imagine sometimes Paul means one and sometimes he means the other. I don't know that. Uh, yeah. But certainly later on, you see a lot of Christians who start talking about Israel as the Christian faith community and not the biological descent from Israel community. Uh, you could thank Paul for that. Uh, Galatians 3, where he makes the seed, yep. one seed, Christ. His argument's obvious. If they were all actual ethnic descendants of Abraham or in some sense claiming to be, you wouldn't need to make that kind of argument. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, thank you uh, for that. Let's get back to the Samaritans. I think it's worth vindicating them for a second because I've talked to the high priest currently, the high okay. priest of the Samaritans today's grandson. Um, and wonderful guy. I mean, he really is such a great guy. One day, if I go out there to go visit, he's like, I'll take you around D and we'll show you the tours and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. But like, there's this beef that has happened for well over two millennia. I mean, it's, you know, a couple hundred years BC, at least there seems to have been an issue between Samaritans and Jews. And it's my guess that what we find in the Samaritan tradition might be anachronistic or though they claim ancient um, roots, I think there might be some roots to the people themselves. Their impact of what they have today is kind of a reaction to some of the Jewish propaganda that is up against them. So yeah. what what's behind that window of the propaganda? I wish we had. Um, but tell us what you found about the Samaritans right. and the people who are left in the land. Right. So this is, uh, you know, the, this is the second chapter of my book is about Samaritans. And the whole point is that because we have two groups that are actually almost certainly descended from Israelites or the people of the Bible think of as Israelites who have different visions of who Israel is and tell the same stories differently from each other. That's the reason not to discriminate against other people around the world who tell these same stories differently from each other. It's already happening in the biblical period. But here's the basic story. Uh, 2 Kings 17 is the only biblical account of the conquest of Israel by Assyria. You don't actually even get one in, in Chronicles, which is typically uh, the same history told a little bit differently. What 2 Kings 17 claims is that every person in Israel, more or less, was taken into Assyrian exile, and only Judah remained. And then the Assyrians brought in uh, a bunch of people from Assyria, and they settled them, supposedly, in the towns of Israel. So for millennia, the Jewish tradition has been that the Samaritans are the descendants of those people that the Assyrians brought in. And one of the things that I thought when I started doing this research is like, okay, so like they've been, you know, in this land, believing this since the 8th century BC, that seems like a long time, regardless of where they come from. But uh, recent research has, has really vindicated their their claims where it there is no evidence. Um, so it does seem like there were deportations from Israel to Assyria. That was a relatively common Near Eastern practice, but at most like 20% of the population of Israel. And, you know, you can imagine, like, imagine, like, trying to get every person who lives in Israel today on a bus and shipping them out of town. It's quite an operation. That, that didn't happen. And there is no evidence that large populations of foreigners were brought into Israel at that time. So 
all of the evidence we have suggests that the vast majority of people living in Israel after the Assyrian conquest were still Israelites, and that this is an instance when the Judahite authors of this history tried to write out other Israelites from the story of Israel so they could claim to be the Israel. And we don't have Samaritan traditions from this period. The oldest Samaritan tradition we have is the Samaritan Pentateuch itself. So the Samaritans don't have a Hebrew Bible. They just have a Pentateuch. They just have the first five books. Um, and it's different in some ways, not too many. Well, there's a lot of differences, but most of them aren't that important. Um, they have a different holy site, like you mentioned, Mount Gerizim instead of Jerusalem. But a lot of the traditions that do exist uh, are about how they acknowledge, as the Judahites do not, and the Jews do not or did not, um, that the they're both descended from Israelites, but they claim that the Judahites are the ones who have the wrong Pentateuch and are doing things incorrectly. Um, so on the one hand, this is a story about how two people with a biological claim to descent from the people of the Bible told the same stories differently from each other, which sets up, I think, the, the other case studies in the book that are about how people later on and around the world did the same thing. We can't say that there's one story because there's already two from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a vision of how different people who are, who are located in different parts of this tribal system were able, because of because the northern tribes and the southern tribes are different people, to inherit the same traditions but use them differently, construct Israel differently, construct Israel against each other, use it to compete, and that's also what we see later on, even when people aren't competing, we see people using the same features of the tradition to explain why they're the best Israel that there is, even though it's not necessarily against other Israels. So the Samaritans, you know, they'll tell their story of Israel in a way that says we're both Israelites, but we're better Israelites. The Judahites will tell their story, you know, we're Judahites, uh, you're not even Israelites. But those are those are different ways of competing. And this is, you know, I think I say in the book, I don't know if you're a sports fan. It seems like uh, I'm a sports fan. You know, uh, forfeit is not the only way to win a game. You can also play the other team on their own terms. And we get a lot of that in the competition between traditions. That's what it looks like to me. I guess if I were to compare which one's worse in terms of the way they're attacking each other, when you say they're not even one of us at all, that seems a little harsher. Um, yeah. Uh, my friend Abud is his name, uh, Cohen, and he's the grandson of the high priest. He said, we think Jews are definitely descendant of Abraham. We just think they get some things wrong. Right. And Jews seem to be like, oh, they don't just get some things wrong. They're not us, That's it right. seems. And there's a rabbi. I can't remember his name. You know, there's thousands of opinions, of course, of rabbis throughout the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Tosefta, you know, throughout time. And one of them actually calls the Samaritans Gentiles. Yeah. So, you know, they're jabbing at him like, hey, you're not even Israel. Um, I, I just thought the tradition was interesting and wondering if there are any remnants in the Samaritan tradition that go before, but we aren't probably able to discern that, huh? Yeah. My sense of things is that the Samaritan, so, uh, I always struggle about when to start calling the people who live in Judah Jews, because the Hebrew Bible's religion is so different from Judaism. The Jews are descended from the people of Judah. When you read the Hebrew Bible, it's a, it's a religion of temples, priests, and sacrifices. And Judaism, of course, is a religion of rabbis and synagogues and no sacrifices. So it's very different in a lot of ways. My sense is that Judaism and Samaritanism are, in, in some ways, Christianity as well, um, similarly timed evolutions of the same body of biblical tradition in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So I am sure that there is in Samaritan tradition, some older traditions. Um, I, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch is a different end product of the same long process that produced the biblical Pentateuch. It would be very hard to tell which they are. Thank you for those responses. I'm going to jump to um, some of the, some of the, chosen Israelites here in the chat who have super chatted uh, sages and pages, according to Assyrian records, which peoples were resettled in the territory of the former kingdom of mm -hmm. Israel, which we just answered. You would say there probably wasn't. Yeah. So we do have Assyrian records of Israelites in Assyria. And so that's part of the reason we know some deportations happens. We, I think don't have records of Assyrians and we wouldn't necessarily have records, but I don't think we have any Assyrian records that say we sent these people to Israel. Mm 
Thank you, Sages and Pages. Good to see you in the chat. Doc Pleromana, appreciate that super chat, earning your way to remain in the 12 tribes. We don't want to cut you out. Like, uh, isn't there a place where Benjamin gets cut out and the judges or something? I can't remember. One of the tribes did something like radical. That's right. And, and, and they ended up like, it was bad. It was like a Holocaust to themselves. It was like really bad. I, I can't remember exactly the story. Yeah, they they did some, uh, they it was a war and then they decided that the Benjaminites shouldn't be part of the community anymore. Uh, but Correct. ultimately everyone got sad about the idea of them not being a tribe of Israel anymore. And they let them back in. <laughs> it's an interesting uh, narrative there. Modern Samaritan DNA studies of Mel's found they were closer to Israeli Jewish priest than the wider Kohanim, despite Jos uh, Josephus grumblings. Mm -hmm. But can we really find a historical narrative this way? That's a great question. I mean, this is, um, Every time that there's a genetic study, it tells us about biology and biology is related to traditions to some extent. Some of the time, you know, you're likely to inherit your traditions from people you're related to. We get it from our parents. They get it from their parents. But because of the new way of thinking about ethnic identity, and that's just, this has been true since the 1960s and 70s, you can create a new vision of your own identity. You can become a different identity, despite no matter whether or not you're really descended from certain people. So the. Um, the Jewish priesthoods of various kinds are often uh, biological in nature. So, you know, I think in the, the religious context, the possibility of blood descent matters. Uh, but I think you're still going to find that Samaritan and Jewish and Judite and Israelite visions of Israel are different from each other for reasons that don't have much to do with, with biology at all. Thank you. Doc Pleromanon again, can the Shechem Shiloh polity of the Iron One be identified as the earliest Israel? Mm -hmm. In other words, when was the territorial name Shechem replaced by the name Israel for a polity in approximately the same territory? Yeah, Thank great you. question. I mean, this is, um, so the earliest artifact we have that relates to Israel at all uses the name Israel for something. This is the Merneptah it's from 1207 BC or so. The Egyptians have invaded the region, Pharaoh Merneptah, and he says, we destroyed Israel. And obviously they didn't, but the point is that there's a they people are no named more. Israel. <laughs> That's right. There's a people named Israel living in this region. I don't think that we have any epigraphic evidence that the region was called Shechem in early periods. The city was called Shechem. Um, but Samaria is a common name for Israel throughout this period. So we are, we're lacking a lot of stuff that could tell us what the kingdoms were called in early periods. Um, the epigraphic information we have suggests that Judah was called the house of David by um, outsiders and that Israel was sometimes called the house of, of Omri, Beit Omri and, and Beit David, rather than these other names. The question of what Iron One settlements represent the earliest Israel is complicated because identity is complicated. And many people see identity now as an outgrowth of political structures. So some people would say that we can't really, we can, there's a people, we know there's a people called Israel in this region already in the late Bronze Age, let alone in the Iron One. But can we think of them as our Israel until there is a kingdom and a political structure that makes them resemble the Israel that we know is a more complicated question. So there'll be people who will point at there's no pig bones in the early community in the iron one. So they're already keeping kosher. And there's people who will, you know, point to certain continuities between pottery over this period to say like, they have a similar material culture. And I think it's reasonable. Um, we don't know for sure the history of the names Israel and Judah as regions. We, and the, the question of what iron one settlements should be thought of as Israel, quote Israel, so to speak, is one that's really going to be subjective depending on who you are. Wow. There's a lot there. Uh, you men mentioned Omri and I was reminded of uh, Finkelstein's book from like yeah. 20 years ago and he goes into this stuff. But um, anyway, next super chat, next super chat. Aaron, good to see you in the chat. It's been a minute. Thank you for tithing. Uh, just tuning in, assuming the 12 tribes are a myth. Do you have any idea where all these genealogies are coming from? All made up or shoebox yes. info. So you may have missed the point where you're like, it's not all made up, but right. there seems to be a narrative being concocted here. Yeah. So first of all, I think it's virtually certain that there were tribes of Israel, even in very early periods. There just probably weren't 12 of them. So like I say, probably the oldest book text in the entire Hebrew Bible is Judges 5, which is a tribal list. It just doesn't have, it isn't a 12 tribe list. Uh, 
It doesn't have the tribes of Judah, Simeon, Levi, I think maybe Gad, one of the other ones anyway. And it does have some other things that uh, don't appear later on, which we can't say for sure whether they're being counted as tribes, but uh, Moroz is a name we don't see in other places. Mahir and Gilead are treated elsewhere as sub-tribes of Manasseh, but I don't think there's any reason to think that they're not treated as part of the, the tribes of Israel, individual tribes in Judges 5 itself. Because it's so early, we don't know anything to compare it to. So I think what happened is that the Judites adopted and adapted an existing tribal tradition and expanded it, but that the evidence really does back up the idea that some version of a familiar tribal list is very early. Thank you. Appreciate that. Derek Cruz, thanks for the super chat. Great discussion. Thank you, Derek and Andrew. Um, let me make sure I caught up here because uh, we are caught up. Okay, so here's the question I wanted to dive into in this narrative form. Manasseh and um, Ephraim, we have this blessing in not Genesis 49, but Genesis 48, where Joseph yeah. is blessing them. What is the significance of this narrative? Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting narrative. So what happens in that text, if I'm not mistaken, is that Jacob says, like, you guys are also going to be counted as if you're my sons, just like these other guys. And this is one of the, the central problems of the 12 tribes tradition, where sometimes the 12 tribes tradition has Joseph and Levi in it. And sometimes the 12 tribes tradition has Ephraim and Manasseh instead of Joseph and Levi. And Ephraim and Manasseh are described as the two sons of, of Joseph. So the explanation for people who believe that the 12 tribes tradition is very early and historically accurate is that at some point, it was decided that Levi would not count as a secular tribe anymore because it was the priestly tribe. And Joseph would be split into two to keep the traditional number of 12 alive. If you're like me, <coughs> excuse me, and you don't necessarily think that the 12 tribes tradition is that ancient, you're probably just looking at competing traditions. Um, there probably were people who thought of Levi as one of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you're thinking of people who are living in Judah in the 6th and 5th century BC, and they've got all these odds and ends of traditions, and they're trying to make sense of them and systematize them and tell a new comprehensive story of all Israel that includes both Israel and Judah as part of all Israel, they were probably simply people who disagreed on how to do it. Uh, Manasseh is typically speaking in the Transjordan, which was a sort of um, border region of Israel going east. So there may have been people who didn't think of Manasseh as you know, necessarily Israelite. And Ephraim is the central and most important region of the kingdom of Israel. So I suspect that, you know, the Joseph concept is one that is meant to gesture to a larger Israel and um, a better bound together Israel. And Manasseh and Ephraim are, are more, you know, maybe the Transjordan is something else. Um, but I would view them as competing visions of who Israel can be. And actually, if you look in, so there's six or seven tribal lists in the book of Numbers alone. And a lot of those are the ones that don't have Levi. But this is also the book that was most certainly, besides Leviticus, written largely by priestly authors. So I happen to think that rather than the removal of Levi being based on Levi becoming the priestly tribe instead of a secular tribe, it was actually something that priests did to elevate Levi over the other tribes. And that's what hmm. you see a lot of time in, in numbers is Levi is mentioned alongside these 12 tribe lists. And the other 12 tribes are often doing things like bringing Levi gifts or making them sacrifices or putting them in the center of the community. So I think anything that involves Levi, the priests were probably involved. Um, pertaining to Abraham, how does the narrative of Abraham incorporate itself into your what you're painting the frame as and then i wanted to get into moses too like yeah. you know levi wants to attach himself to aaron of course they're, they're, they're just right. you know so in what way does the the narrative or might i say myth of abraham what is that significance mm -hmm. and him being blessed and his descendants can you tell us a bit about the story of abraham and how it plays into this yeah i mean the the fascinating thing about genealogy is its capacity to include or exclude and even today, if I were to say Abrahamic religions, you would think of three different religions. And if I were to say Judeo-Christian, you would think of two different religions. So Abrahamic is a wider frame and includes more people. And I think that's what you get in the Hebrew Bible as well, where Abraham spends most of his time hanging out with Hittites or Aramaeans or, you know, he, he's, he 
the Philistines, the Egyptians, he is an inclusive figure. And so he's somebody you could gesture to if you wanted to describe an open Israel, an Israel that was willing to engage with the wider world in a certain way. Um, and the wider genealogy is, the more that you can you can do that. So we even get, you know, in the book of Maccabees, which is not biblical, but later, you get a weird story about the support, the Spartan supposedly writing a letter to the Israelites and saying, we heard that you guys are descended from Abraham. We're descended from Abraham. Let's be friends. That's how inclusive <laughs> yeah. Abraham can be as a figure. Right. Um, the more you narrow down a genealogy, the less that, that you get that. And I think that's what we see. And then when it comes to Moses, I mean, the fascinating thing about Moses is he doesn't really have a genealogy after that. Um, so we hear that he has some sons. We hear that, you know, they might be running a temple in Dan. But the focus on the Aaronid priesthood, and Aaron is Moses' brother, as most of you probably know, is so interesting given that Moses is the more important figure in the Pentateuch. So why wouldn't it be the, the Moses priesthood? And I think that you know, those two facts are related to each other, that actually Moses' genealogy is kind of effaced in the text because of the hegemony of the Aaronid priests who, you know, didn't want uh, competition. And there's a lot of biblical texts that get rid of competition for the Aaronid priests. The Korahites were apparently a priestly lineage. They lived in, in Jerusalem in later periods. And there's a story in Numbers where, you know, they're swallowed by the desert. And then they had to like put in, nevertheless, the line of Korah didn't line up, didn't die out because they... Um, well, they show up later on, so they have to admit that they still exist. There's uh, in the books of Samuel, uh, Saul kills all the priests of uh, a place called uh, Nob, and um, Anatoth is, is related to that. And then, you know, Jeremiah comes from this same place later on, so they can't have all been killed because he's a priest from that place. So I think a lot of the Bible is about a competition between different priestly lineages that is often conducted along these genealogies. Wow, I, I, you made me think on Abraham why Paul really went back to using Abraham for his model for Christians yep. to be in Christ. It's not only is the narrative inclusive in its original context, but it also, um, it of course, makes his seed special in the narrative, but nonetheless still inclusive. Um, you're looking at Paul who's using that very inclusive guy yep. to include people who are not actually of the seed, literally. That's right. And the one book, uh, paper I've ever given on uh, the New Testament that uh, I was invited by, by Robin Walsh to give was about some of the genealogies of Jesus, of Jesus that you have in, in the New Testament, where sometimes they go back to David, sometimes they go back to Abraham, sometimes they go back to Adam. And I think that it all depends on how big you want Christianity to be. So if your, whole, if your point is that the whole world is related to Jesus, you're probably willing to welcome anybody into that community. If your point that, you know, Jesus is descended from David, you're probably gesturing at the political uh, rights that Christians should have in Israel. And if you're going back to Abraham, you're probably <laughs> gesturing at, you know, a smaller community. So, um, That's all... amazing that you observed that because Luke being, it seems like it really broadens up the picture yeah. of the Christ community. And it goes all the way to Adam. Like, let's right. try and make this humanity. And then here you have Matthew, which is saying, there will be those who come to me on that day and saying, I did this in your name and that in your name, you workers of lawlessness. Like it has a Torah aspect to its gospel message. Right. And so this is, mm, are you taking notes, yeah. everybody? This is good. This is, I mean, you know, so uh, many Western explorers, many European explorers who went to, you know, they went to America, went to other places, India and so on and so forth. They went with Genesis 10 in their head, which is called the Table of Nations. It's a story of people who descended from, uh, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the game was like, if you run across a new people, who are they in this genealogy? Because if there's a flood, and if the only people who survive the flood is the family of Noah, and if Genesis 10 lays out all the peoples who are descended from Noah and his children, got to be one of those, right? There's nobody who didn't survive the, the flood. And a lot of uh, lost tribe traditions come from that because people would, you know, come up in a place and be like, well, they don't look like these guys. Maybe they're the lost tribes of Israel after all. they got to be out there somewhere. Uh, but the, the trick of using genealogies to try to decide, you know, who prophecies apply to, who can be part of a community and so on and so forth happens because if you start out with Adam or you start out with Noah 
everybody is related to anybody else. That's as inclusive as you can get. Right. And then the more you focus on, all right, Abraham or just Jacob or whatever, the more exclusive your framing of who the community can be is. And that's apocalyptic prophecies, that's membership in the community, that's everything. When I read Audio Fear, Ishai Rosen's feed book on Goy, uh, Israel's birth of multiple others and stuff, he goes into Ezra and Nehemiah. I didn't know if you want, like, if you have a thought, they're very exclusive, but they're not so exclusive that there isn't a porous boundary, but the porous mm-hmm. boundary is limited, mm-hmm. I would say, to Persians or like very unique individuals who are on their side, That's but right. it excludes a bunch of other people. So the seed yeah. needs to be holy and separate. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, those are uh, people often say the Hebrew Bible says this about something. And it's just not true because it's a composite text that involves so many different perspectives. So if you're saying the Hebrew Bible says this and you're pointing to Ezra and Nehemiah, you're probably saying something incredibly xenophobic. Those are the most xenophobic books in the Hebrew Bible by right. by a large margin. They don't want uh, intermarriage. They don't want you know anybody. They make people divorce if they're married to somebody who's outside the community. They you know make children go away. Um I don't know if they do that, but uh, something similar. Um, At the same time, you still have texts in Isaiah that are probably from the same period because there are probably multiple different authors in Isaiah that talk about how, you know, anybody really can be a member of the community. So it is not the only opinion that's out there. But yeah, Ezra and Nehemiah have a strong concentration on blood descent, pure blood Israelites in a way that's, I think, pretty uncomfortable. Is it fair to say that the rabbis in the Talmud and and all this stuff, it's the same way. It's a composite uh, piece of literature with various opinions. Yeah. And just you wouldn't like want to say because you find something ugly somewhere in this literature that therefore every Jew or most Jews or, you know, there's inherently something just horrible about these people. Right. Yeah. Anti-Semitism, I think, births from stuff like this. Yeah, there, uh, there's a lot of mischaracterizations and a lot of picking and choosing of uh, what these traditions are about. So, I mean, a lot of rabbinical literature literally is an argument. It'll be, you know, this rabbi said this and this rabbi said that and what people thought about it and the laws that evolve out of those those conversations. So for sure, you know, I mean, the one idea that is very common is that, you know, the God of the Hebrew Bible is wrathful. The God of the New Testament is forgiving. And yeah, I mean, you know, there are times when the God of the Hebrew Bible is wrathful. And then there are also times when the God of the Hebrew Bible is forgiving because so many different people are involved. And we got to give the ancient Israelites and Judites the ability to have the same full range of emotions and perspectives as we do. Um, And it seems like from the text they did. Final super chat here. And then we're going to plug your book here. Cheryl Lyle, thank you again for the super chat. It's good to see you here. Fundamentalists say the Bible is inerrant and inspired by God. Leading Christian apologists would refute what you've written. How would you respond to them? Ooh, big question. <laughs> um, you know, I teach, obviously, the Hebrew Bible. And um, I often have students from confessional backgrounds of various kinds. And hopefully... Um, I am always at least respectful of of people's beliefs. I have never had the intention of converting anybody to anything or making anybody turn against God or or anything of of that sort. Um, I feel like if people come to my class and they are willing to at least learn how secular scholars do things, even if they go away at the end of the day and say, like, I'm glad I learned that, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm a biblical narratist. I'm okay with that. I think from a historical perspective, it's painfully clear that a lot of things in the Hebrew Bible aren't true. Um, So it is purely a matter of faith that they must be true. Uh, And I leave that to other people, frankly. I just, you know, I try to not insult anybody's beliefs. I'm coming at it from this is what secular (laughs) scholars and historians will tell you about it. I'm thinking, like, have, do you have, I don't, no names needed, but like, have you had someone in your class start off that way? And then by the end of their course, they're like, oh my gosh, you really, really, really <laughs> like messed me up here. I think, I think it goes both ways. I mean, I think that I'll, basically when a lot of people get to college, they just haven't had a whole lot of um, opportunity to think about, about life. You know, you get handed a lot of ideas about life from your parents and so on and so forth. So if you were going to end up being the kind of person who, um, you know, became less invested in a particular faith tradition over time, that's going to happen regardless of whether you're in my class or not. And if you are someone who that's not going to happen to you, you know, again, all I'm telling you is what scholars and historians think. Uh, 
if you if you can't survive what uh, other people's opinions are on the subject, then you know it's, it's going to be a hard time. So I have certainly had students who have. So like you know if you if you want people to be in your class, if you want a reasonable class side and you're teaching about the Hebrew Bible, there's going to be some you know um, believers in there. Of course, I mean that's what draws people. To love, that's what why many people are interested in the Hebrew Bible. So you want to create a welcoming environment for that. Yeah. Um, have I had people who have thought about their faith a lot over the course of a semester? Of course. And like I say, I think I think it goes both ways. And I think that there have been plenty of people who came in the door, you know, largely an er inerrantist and they left largely an inerrantist. In excuse me, it's hard to pronounce for some reason. Um, but hopefully uh, learn some things about uh, at least the scholarship that exists and how a contemporary scholar thinks about things. I, I seriously appreciate you, your time today. And I don't want to burn that bridge of like milking all the time I can here. Um, I want to do future episodes with you so we can get into the medieval period, the Mormons. Uh, also, maybe there's some stuff as I go on reading that I see and go, ooh, we didn't touch that along the right. way. Um, so I ask that everybody, please, I, I don't just say this. You know I'm a shameless plug, but I really mean this. The academics that I interview here on Myth Vision – when they see the publisher goes, hey, I don't know what you did, uh, but we're doing really good here. Uh, people are buying the works. They're interested in the topic at hand and showing that you don't have to be in the academic circles or libraries purchasing these uh, really, really well-documented scholarly accounts, if you will, the myth of the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to give these scholars incentive to come back and join me for the episode where you have the opportunity to also ask them questions and it's great information. You really should know this stuff. So get a copy. When was this published? Last year this or this year. year? No, it was earlier this year. Wow. It was like May or June, I think. This is an amazing book. In fact, Cattell Berthelow, when I talked to her this morning, she said, I haven't um, heard of it yet. But I told her how it plays into like her work, you, there's like an overlap in some sense of what you're doing and, and what she's doing. So please go get this book. And then also what I want to talk to you about it in the future as well is your other work here, which the sons of Jacob and the sons of, is it, how do I pronounce this? Heracles? Heracles. It's, Heracles. it's just the nickname of Hercules. Okay. And yep. this seems, is that the older spelling of it? Yep. I want to really dive into this. I know that most people won't be able to afford this this book, but you've got my attention on wanting to go into the Greek world more and like mm -hmm. understand how they did things. I think that we can sometimes use a heuristic approach as well when we know what other cultures are doing in contemporary times and it looks like it's walking like a duck and talking like a duck. It might be a duck or at least to have some influence there. Right. So there's that. There's also interviews that you need to watch on Brother Garfield's podcast, what he did with him. That was a blast. I had fun with that. And then Andrew Henry, um, he does one based on your work here in telling people what happened to the 10 lost mm -hmm. tribes of Israel. Yeah, and I was, I, I helped write the script for that one. And, you know, we had a lot of, a good time doing that one. I think it turned out really well. I thought so too. He, his edits are always phenomenal. And mm -hmm. I put those links in the description so others can go watch those when we're done. Hey, come on, join the 12 tribes of myth vision. All you got to do is just join the Patreon and, and you're in. I don't have uh, circumcision requirements. I don't require you to have dietary uh, or even like what day of the week. As long as you join me every once in a while for a live stream, we're good to go. Um, yeah, there, I, I don't want to get lost into the pericope. Is there any final words you would want to say to somebody who's interested in this topic that they should probably yeah, read? I mean, or? You know, this is uh, what I what I tried to do most of all is that uh, the study of the 12 tribes tradition has been broken up between Hebrew Bible scholars and everybody else. So Hebrew Bible scholars have studied it in the Hebrew Bible exhaustively. And other stories about where the 12 tribes went and what happened to them has been other people's business. So I just uh, try to say, hey, this is one tradition that a lot of people are making their own and finding meaning in. Let's talk about that history from the beginning to the end. And if you find it interesting, maybe you like the book. Yeah, I must admit, I mean, I show my cards. I kind of have a, a motivation for trying to reduce tribalism as much as possible because of the world we live in. Um, so I think educating this will give people who might appreciate the legend or appreciate the mythology or appreciate the narrative, but 
there is a lot that comes out of this. And in the beginning of this chat, I had to block a guy, Arian something. And I mean, I didn't even notice till a few chats and it was nuts. I mean, it was just yep. the white people are the chosen and we are the yep. ones. And I'm like, yep, these are the, you are the reason I am motivated to yep. debunk these notions because it's dividing us more than we need to be. So thank you for your time. Get the book. Uh, any final words? That's it. It's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. And thanks so much for everybody for, for tuning in. Thank you. Stick around just one second. Never forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are the 12 tribes of Mythvision. <laughs>